Good afternoon. <coughs> First of all, I would like to congratulate Professor Chris Chappell and Dr. Niranjan Kaur Khalsa for organizing excellent conference. It is a historical moment for me because now the second generation of scholars in the field of Sikh studies have taken over in starting organizing these conferences. So it's, it's really a great moment. The religious music is frequently described as the source of spiritual elation, social cohesion, and empowerment in cultures around the world. The singing of hymns, Shabad Kirtan, in the congregational worship is the heart of Sikh devotional experience. Through such Kirtan, the devout Sikhs attune themselves to vibrate in harmony with the divine word and thereby immerse themselves in the deeper levels of its meaning. Guru Nanak, the founder of the Sikh tradition and the succeeding gurus laid great emphasis on the performance of those ragas that produce a balanced effect on the minds of both listeners and performers. In actual performance, both classical and folk tunes are employed frequently, keeping in mind the sociological significance of the folk traditions. There is an intimate connection between music, poetry, language and meaning in the utterances of the Gurus, Gurbani, recorded in the Sikh scripture, the Guru Granth Sahib. In musical theory, the ragas are composed to suit various moods, intervals of time and specific seasons. Each raga has acquired particular spiritual significance of its own on the basis of tradition and usage. In the scriptural text itself, the names of the ragas and rhythms to be used in devotional singing are stated at the beginning of each section of hymns. These musical instructions in the written text fulfill the same score, fulfill the same function as that of a musical score in relating to performed music. Like written music, the written text of the Gurus has spiritual power only as it is sung or performed. First of all, let me turn to Dr. Bob Ponder Linden's skillful analysis of Jain Bhakti and Sikh Kirtan, in which he offers some comparative historical connections between the two traditions. I don't see the slide here, but this is the opening slide that he is referring to. I just, I just want to okay. this. this really very captivating slide. As a historian, Dr. Bob uh, Linden has, does his job meticulously and interprets traces of evidence to make his case effectively. His opening PowerPoint slide depicts Maharaja Ranjit Singh in Lahore Bazaar with Swetambar Jain walking aside the elephant. It's truly impressive. If a Sikh king is shown to be displaying his regal paraphernalia, the carefree white-clad monk is equally impressive of his Jain identity and he's basically looking to the future that there will be many kings like him around the world, one who's sitting over there. So, to a certain extent, 
it is not possible to speak of a single organic or monolithic bhakti movement throughout India because Dr. Linden looks at these two traditions through the lens of bhakti movement. Different groups employed various original languages in their poetry, directed their devotion to different deities, and assumed distinct theological positions in their discourses. In particular, some devotees were inward-looking solitary spiritual seekers, while others adopted a more outward, socially critical orientation to the world around them. Dr. Wander Linden rightly points out that Jain Bhakti had been written in every language used by Jains over the centuries. For instance, older hymns are written in Sanskrit and Tamil, while majority of medieval modern ones are written in Gujarati and Hindi, including in dialects such as Marwadi. Similarly, Guru Nanak employed old Punjabi for his hymns, while later Gurus increasingly composed in Braj Bhasha. Dr. Wander Linden makes another significant point in his anal analysis. He contends that the avatar theory is a syncretistic device and classical and local traditions all over India have long used it to incorporate various deities and legendary figures into the Vish Vishnu tradition. Accordingly, the green-bodied Jain teacher ends up in Patiala through this avatar sequence, which is also mentioned in the Dasam Granth. So this is really very interesting. I, I read the whole portion of Dasam Granth while uh, reviewing your article. But there's no mention of any Jain. Uh, because Parasnath or Parshvanath was already assimilated into the large Hindu discourse through the avatar theory as Buddha was accepted as an avatar. So this is an absorbing tendency of the Hindu tradition and which is regarded as an ocean that absorbs everything into it. But I would like to see more explanation of the occurrence of this uh, slide there, you know, uh, the paintings uh, at the Mubarak Pila are basically depicting the Dasam Granth myths and mythology. And Parasnath is part of this, that discourse. And you have to make the case why Guru Gobind Singh is using that mythology what is his intention in the early, late 17th or early 18th century? All these are thought. It's, it's, a, it's a strategy to trace back your genealogy to later, earlier avatars and, and try to make a case that Guru Gobind Singh and his community also enjoys the same status and power and authority that earlier ancient avatars and important figures of repression, spiritual repression enjoyed at, at that time. So that there, there's, there's a need to work out this, this section more. I would also like to know uh, uh, how you will uh, connect these two traditions as part of Maharaj Ranjit Singh's Darbar, does the painter is trying to make the case that Ranjit Singh's kingdom is a sort of secular kingdom which, in which all communities are enjoying equal sort of status and authority. So this basically is an excellent example. You can also see Muslim Artisans are working and, and all Hindus and, and Muslims and Jains and all sort of people are there. So there is a need to work out more on this to, to make the case. After all, it's a very important slide. Undoubtedly, devotional singing 
was an essential component of bhakti normative practices. It was more meditative than emotional. Dr. Linden's arguments provide us with a comparative framework as follows. As common to the bhakti movement, Jain and Sikh devotional music generally linked up to various folk music genres. Simultaneously, however, the raga designations in Jain hymns books and the Guru Granth Sahib show that Jain composers and the Sikh gurus were familiar with the art music of their times. By listening to another presentation uh, by uh, Professor Whitney Kelting, you know, uh, she was uh, displaying uh, some songs uh, by Jain women, you know. Uh, I had a question why there are not men singers? Are there group men, male singers as well within the Jain tradition, or it's all female groups of women who are trying to sing? Uh, are there ragas, you know, you have, you're making the case, you know, there, there, there are uh, ragas all, also, designations are also mentioned in both texts. This is what I all got uh, from Whitney, I read from her book, that there are male groups, and in the uh, Puja books, in some of them, there are ragas. They may be attached later on, but, but I would like to see the earlier evidence. Again, that is part of the folk tradition. Because in the in the Adgrand, in the Sikh scripture, you know, it, it's a very complex, you know, uh, raga system. In comparison to Jain Bhakti, nonetheless, Sikh Kirtan evolved much more in interaction with the world of North Indian Hindu Hindustani classical music in terms of theory, performance, practice, used instruments. And for example, the string instruments and intricate drumming of the Sikh musical tradition never became part of the Jain devotional music. That's a very important point to, to be, you know, further developed. In addition, Sikh Kirtan became much based on the classical music style of the Drupad and later Khyal. In contrast, Jain Bhakti remained firmly based upon various Western Indian folk music genres, with the result that a truly trans-regional Jain musical tradition never emerged. As a matter of fact, while Jain intellectuals had their debates with Mughal rulers and their bhakti texts sometimes also were influenced by Muslim literary culture, the Sikh tradition developed much more in interaction with Persian and Central Asian cultural practices. Uh, this is an area you know, where you have to look at Sikh musical tradition not only simply Hindustani music tradition, but there were a number of ragas coming from the Afghanistan, you know, Central Asia. Asa rag does not exist in Indian religious traditions. And Budhans, Maru, uh, and there are five ragas which are, are clearly unique to, to Gunanak's contribution. So this is a very important area. Two reasons for this were geography of Punjab and the closely intertwined historical relationship between the Sikhs and the Mughals. Sikh illustrated manuscripts, court culture, and indeed musical practices are only a few examples here. Alternately, the lineage of Muslim performers of Kirtan, the so-called Rababis, who entered the traditions in the footsteps of Murdana, the fellow traveler and accomplished on the Rabab of Guru Nanak, remains a telling in this context. Unfortunately, however, this lineage has almost died out because of modern Sikh identity politics and the partition of British India into India and Pakistan. But still, there are a number of Rababis, you know, who became Khalsa Sikhs after 1947. And their children are still living in North America, you know, and practicing the original ragas. I happened to listen to uh, uh, Labdeep Singh uh, in Bay Area, you know. He, he was invited by my daughter and, and, and he was his parents belong to the Rababi tradition. There are still Rababis present in modern Punjab and all over the world. They and they are carrying on the tradition. But they don't play the role of temple. And they used to do... No, they, they, they can play because they, they are no Khalsa Sikhs. Oh, okay. They converted. Uh, so this is very important uh, area because Sikh music is basically the combination of so many streams of musical traditions 
a Bobby tradition, Bible Deep Singh is uh, making the claim of that particular family lineage. But there were other lineages, traditions, the Bobby traditions, and others, you know, are simultaneously going on at the same time. So we need to explore more. For example, uh, he has mentioned a number of exiles. Uh, uh, I have listened to the music of Dodar Texal. They were blinds, you know. Ragi Jaswan Singh was a blind, and Ragi Balwan Singh, who was a professor at Sidma College. Excellent Kirtan. I have never heard anyone playing like him. Maybe you have heard about him. He died a long time ago. Balwan Singh, he was a blind musician. So they were the products of Dodar Taksal, very famous and popular Taksal in Punjab. And there are other Taksal, Narasar Taksal, you know, and so on. So there's a need to, to explore in this area. Narendran Kurkhal raises an important issue in her insightful engendering the female voice in Sikh devotional music. Her paper addresses the controversy relating to the demand by initiated Sikh women to perform Kirtan and Seva inside the Golden Temple. Let me give you some historical background to this important issue. Bibi Jagir Kaur, after taking over the Shroomni Gurudwara Prundak Committee chief in 1999, had announced to treat Khalsa women on a par with men for discharging religious duties in the Golden Temple. Earlier, then acting Jathedar of Kaal Takhmanji Singh had taken a group of initiated Khalsa women to perform seva in the sanctum, sanctum along with the wife of late Harpajan Singh Yogi. Notwithstanding her announcement on February 3rd, 2003, Bibi Kiran a former general secretary of SGPC, could not arrange Kirtan by Sikh women in the sanctum sanctum because other members of the executive committee of SGPC objected by claiming that women could not be allowed to perform Kirtan duty a variety of reasons. They said the Almighty had differentiated man from woman at the time of birth, hence nobody should raise such a demand. Gender discrimination in the Golden Temple was highlighted at the international level on February 15, 2003, when two England-based Sikh women were allegedly assaulted by SGPC volunteers when they tried to participate in Sukhasan ceremony, carrying Gurgan Sahib in planking from the Golden Temple to the Akal or Akal to the Golden Temple. Thus far, Sikh orthodoxy has explicitly said no to Sikh women to perform Kirtan inside the Golden Temple. So this is a important issue. What Niranjan Khalsa and other speakers who participated at uh, Parliament of World Religions, they are a modern generation. Sikh feminists and Sikh scholars are trying to push uh, to bring women forward in every sphere. But if you look at the actual historical situation, this Kirtan revival tradition uh, began after 1984. If one militant son can create such a habit in Punjab and the central government cannot control, could not control Sikh militancy for over a decade, then there were a number of saints were created to to push a community in the direction of devotional singing. Kirtan became much more important. So we need to take that historical context into mind. And I know uh, Bible Deep Singh mentioned Bibi Jaswir Kaur Khalsa. I know her very well. She was my sister-in-law. She was a very devout Sikh lady who devout, devoted entire life to the Kirtan revivalism. And she was the one who basically suggested Baba Sucha Singh and others, you know, to, to focus attention on Kirtan. Uh, because every revolution within the Sikh tradition begins with the Arbab of Guru Nanak or Kirtan or music 
because that is the basis of the Sikh tradition. So go back to the original tradition, bring out the original instruments, Rabab and Saranda and all the string instruments were again brought into Sikh Kirtan. Even now, you know, they have added those instruments into the Golden Temple. So it was a very concerted effort on the part of the Indian government and the Sikh saints, all of them, and scholars even, SGPC, everyone, to give a particular direction to the Sikh community so that they can move away from militancy. And after 1992, you know, 1991 was the first uh, that uh, Gurmat Sangeet Samelan in which they tried to uh, make you know, judgment on different ragas and that these are the original ragas and so on. I believe Singh has uh, given, shown you a number of beautiful uh, original uh, tunes, you know, that he presented here. As a Sikh practitioner, musician, he's excellent. But other things that you are saying, you know, sometimes they overtake the essence, the amrit, the nectar, that should be covered by humility and, and sense of dedication and sense of purpose and mission rather than alienating people and the audience. So my only comment at this moment is to, to work cooperatively, bring people together, because we don't have much time, you know. Uh, I was also a firebrand 20 years back, you know, but you will also, when you come to my age, mellow down and appreciate more because you have an excellent, excellent uh, command over those original tunes, you know. There's no doubt why Avtar Singh, Gurchan Singh has done seminal service to the Sikh community and their son, Ultar Singh was my student, you know. He was, you know, uh, at Guru Public School and, and then he was playing violin and so on. Then he became an engineer, but after the, some time, you know, he again came back, became, now he's practicing professional musician by Kultar Singh. My, my doctoral student, uh, Charles Townsend, has interviewed him, uh, you know, I mean, his thesis is uh, containing a lo very long uh, sort of interview with Kultar Singh and so on. So that tradition is alive, there's no doubt. But we should not think that this is the only tradition. There are multiple traditions within the Sikh tradition. Even during the time of the Gurus, there was no single tradition. I used to listen to a uh, performance early in the morning at 2.30 at Nanakstar, when the main ragi of that tradition, it was my younger days, you know, school days, I'm talking about 60s and earlier times, when he used to play that, that this is the Murdana's Rabab, you know, uh, that tune still vibrates in my mind and heart, you know. So he was, Raghi Keher Singh was a giant among the musicians, but that tradition has not received scholarly attention. And by Jawala Singh's tradition, by Uttar Singh, Gurchan Singh, they wrote books and recorded all that. They are lucky. And we are happy that they did it. But other traditions died out, you know, because there was no, no one there to preserve the tradition to carry on the tradition. So there are so many uh, areas where we need to do more work and so on. I think I should stop here and <laughs> I want to start by invoking a little archaeomusicology. And in my youthful years, I trained with an ethnomusicologist called Ernest McLean. And he lifted up what we find in Plato's Republic, where each of the different governmental systems operates according to a different tuning system. And as we heard about how each of the sections of the sacred literature is pitched in a particular rag, I think we really need to be mindful of music and particularly of singing as a gateway 
a very important gateway to the transcendent. I'd also like to note the rather historic nature of this evening and hearken back to our opening lecture last night. It was a little bit of a throwaway line, but none of her lines are throwaway lines. But she commented that in Maharashtra, of course, there was a bond between the Sikhs and the Jains. And I'm thinking that if this may not be the first, it's nonetheless somewhat historic that this is a true dialogue between these important traditions. And what I want to point out are some symmetries and some asymmetries that arose from our conversations. And the first, it's been brought up, but I wanted to name it, and perhaps we will have some occasion to talk about it over the next um, today and tomorrow. But first is that, uh, as Narinjan was pointing out, in the Golden Temple at least, it's the men who sing. And as Whitney pointed out, Stavan is historically the property of the women. And both you know, here in Buena Park and at various Jain Mandirs in India, it's just so delightful to see the women either lining up with the instruments or rather the percussion tools, not the instruments, um, and singing and with their notebooks and creating and being within uh, a very gendered space and a protected space. And similarly, I think we've all watched um, the Golden Temple um, on TV and seen and then in Gurdwaras where we see the professionals and their men and they are very much owning that space. So I just want to point out that perhaps symmetry. The second, which um, was also just pointed out, was the interesting device through which both traditions in their own way inscribe their narratives onto and locate themselves delicately within, particularly the avatara uh, narrative, where the idea that Vishnu, that there is this, this universal God, and as was pointed out, um, Parshvanath becomes sort of enveloped within the Hindu tradition, just as the Buddha became enveloped within the Hindu tradition. And meanwhile, of course, the Jains are saying, no, really, he isn't an avatara. But at the same time, they create their own par Puranas and their own narratives very much in the style of what is going on in the larger avatara corpus. I have two other places I want to travel. And I think I'll take the latter one first. And this one that occurred to me is about the, again, asymmetry vis-a-vis -vis history. With Jainism, we know that it goes back organizationally at least 2,300 years, more likely 2,800 years, more likely even a bit further back. So that the history is one steeped in the unknown. Whereas with Sikh tradition, we have the very DNA just coursing through the room here of the originators who can name the parampara that says, yeah, we were there right from the beginning and just lift that up as sort of delicious in some ways in terms of both contrast but problematizing it in terms of, okay, so if you can really stake your claim historically, what does that mean? If you cannot really stake a claim historically, what does that mean? And in that same cluster of ideas, I'd like to talk about the diasporas. The John diaspora happened 2,300 years ago with that great famine and leaving the Orissa homeland and going south and going west. And the great Sikh diaspora happened in 1947 with the partition and how, again, uh, so distant in history, but yet so many lessons to be learned in modernity 
from the adaptations of the Jains with the, the new diaspora, first to East Africa, then England, then the United States, and then the six first coming to California 100 years ago or more, and then uh, the diaspora in 1947. So, um, I think there's lots of ways for uh, those rea historical realities to be engaged. And then finally, I want to go full circle back to the um, ethnomusicology. And one of the things that I learned, which again, it was one of those throwaway sentences in Whitney's speech this today, earlier today, about tempered scale. We take it so for granted in the West. And what Socrates said is that first the music changes and then culture changes. And part of my heartache in the news of, that Naringen brings us and that we've heard about uh, today a couple of times is that if we lose the delicacy of those places of the microtone, then we perhaps can be colonized in ways that will be incredibly deadening. Part of the reason that the planet is overheated is because it's a very compelling thing to take control and try to make symmetry where there is no symmetry. Those of us who have rejoiced in either our memories or our experience of India, all of us, even though we can't really talk about it because no one can, is that we rejoice in the unknown, the unpredictable, and the ability somehow with the tilt of the head to move forward. Life becomes fragile when we become colonized by music, that is packaged by others, and life becomes fragile when we fall under the spell of consumerism. The Drupad music, the rag that is to be re-energized with every startup of a song, Okay, that, I think, can bring us into the function and purpose of song, the function and purpose of music, which is to go into and move through and somehow move with the uncertainty that comes with the folk expression from the human heart of why, why these songs came forth. So I look forward to hearing the music tonight and hopefully going into some of those in-between spaces and again joining the Jain community tomorrow night and again going into some of those in-between spaces. And I want to thank you for the music that came forward today and uh, just appreciate that we're all able to be here together. Thank you. Yeah, please. Yeah. We have five minutes here, and then we have to go for a block. Yeah, just to address, because uh, Professor Pashara Singh did uh, mention my work and some of the work that I have, some of the questions that I've questioned. Um, and I must also um, share that it's the first time that we've actually met. And uh, although the works have been quite parallel uh, with some of the names that he has mentioned, and firstly, I would say that you do not question the people who've been asking of humility in the field to be brought in the first place of having humility is the place where I would begin first. Um, the tradition, for example, some of the contemporaries, the attempt has been to classify or stereotype the memory which has been, which has survived in our family as if the uh, copyright or IPR of our family, which is not true. It is the first error that is made in the field. In this field. Um, 
My work, as I came from a totally different um, field, has been that of a researcher. Um, we can easily say that there are Ababis and descendants, but where is the repertoire? I am the person who went around documenting stuff from later 80s, I've documented, I've audio recorded, I've videographed as and as I got the money. Which of the names you would say are, being a descendant of a X family, Y family is one thing. Having a repertoire that goes back to the times of the Gurudwara, to the Gurus, is totally another thing. I've been to Lahore, been to Faisalabad, researched around that. So there's a big problem in just thinking that because the Rababi descendants are there, there is going to be a repertoire. Um, give you one or two examples. Pai Taram Singh Zakmi, they're students of Darshan Singh Komal. They have no memory of the ancient Rababi or lineage, etc., etc. Several Muslims did become um, Sikhs, but they are not necessarily descendants of the pedagogical process, etc. Uh, that's one. Um, then there is an issue about um, ragas. Asa is not the creation of Guru Nanak, is another problem which I see in some of the contemporary works. Baba Sheikh Farid is the original author, oldest author who has sung his Bani in Ragasa, for example. And so Guru Nanak uh, is about four centuries, three and a half, four centuries later than Baba Farid. Um, about Taksal's, the idea of Dodar Taksal, um, um, Parminder's Nanaji was witness to the debate that happened with Ustad by Patan Singh and other mentors, and the day it was disbanded by the Sarpanj of Dodar village. So there, there's, there are stories and I'm privy to them, and it's not the occasion to do that. Um, the taksals of Mastuana, Dodar, Nanaksar, etc., if you name them, 20th century phenomena. We are talking about centuries back. We're talking about the original memories, if there are, wherever there are, let's see them, analyze them, and then debate about them. So these are a few aspects that I would like to share. Uh, lastly, it will be wonderful to sit and debate about these aspects. The tradition needs a very honest debate. And, and, and that somehow that, uh, you know, bespeaks of integrity. It speaks about the courage to disown a lie that has been written or a fiction that has been attempted to be um, historified or, or, or now canonized as history. Uh, I come I come with the ruthlessness that requires that clinical approach, I would say, rather than um, uh, uh, using uh, more more uh, rosy things. But it needs that clinical approach. We need to be able to identify where the memory is, then to analyze it, and then the big, then the subject will begin to. Uh, I mean, I think then there will be business as usual. Just to, uh, well, uh, first of all, let me tell you a very important thing. History is construction. Of course, it is. you cannot fix it in any way that this is the true history. I would like to see the genealogy of your family. You mentioned Pai Sadaran from the time of Guru Angad Devi. I would love to see the connections through 18th century sources, through 17th century sources, through 19th century sources, and to present day your claims. As scholars, we are like you would like to see where is that genealogy, number one. Number two, even when you listen to a Rabi singing, the same hymn sung by the Sikh Rabis, you will find the different styles. Which which Rababi are you mentioning? Any Rababi no, though I have not so many chan, Pai chan, or it's, I, I, I've interviewed him. Yabi, you know, I yes. have that. I, 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 can, I, can, I can play a very important uh, uh, construction right here. Uh, but you know, his memory was very little. I've interviewed him in detail. I started from the first round of the Guru to the last one. The people may get scared when you speak. <laughs> oh, yes, they are. <laughs> it's important too. <laughs> Not just scared. <laughs> Questions are very ferocious. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, have, we have, we have I four, four, uh, four uh, minutes here. It will take some time. Right now. <laughs> well, the point I'm trying to make is that 
history is a uh, constant, you know, uh, process of understanding the past. You know, there are multiple uh, historical narratives. There's no single narrative of any event. No doubt about that. So when you make the claim that this is the real no, narrative, this claims. is the I'm the one asking questions. I have doubts. As a scholar, I will challenge that. I am the one who's challenging. For example, <laughs> what do you say about the Farandiya Rabab? Tell me, have you asked the Patiala University people about the Farandiya Rabab, its origin? Have you asked for their sources? These were not my questions to them. No. So then that's the thing. And I'm asking those questions. No, no, no. There is something else, like Pashara uh, Singh. Uh, if you say you're, that you're talking logically, uh, you make the claim that it's a long tradition. And it's comes, comes straight from the guru, straight from the guru. Yes, that's what he said. Yes, so of course. Sure is referring to. So then, as an historian, you should get all the information as far as possible. Otherwise, it's a claim in the air. That is okay. That's anyway, fine. because we are dealing with a few problems. Yeah? Okay, the music is more important. <laughs> Yes. And I'm going to I restored yes. this work. Yeah. I dug him out of the. Uh, I, I'm just trying to show Ragmala. The first passage of Ragmala is using all the six ragas. This is the first time I have heard from any rag. I have not seen him. But this I'm is not quoting my work. <laughs> it's not quoting yeah. your work. It's not your work. It is Thakur Singh is speaking. It's not your work. It's anyway. You, afterwards, I'll tell you about this. What I meant by that. Just to give you an example, you know, I mean, this. I would like to uh, just to mention about this example that Maharaj Thakur Singh lived in anonymity for 48 years. It took me seven years to knock his door. And in 98 end, he finally invited me. I spent five and a half years to restore his 75 albums. This is one of them. I have all the albums by him. And it was given to me by the Supreme Court. Yes, I He has recorded everything. All Any them. kind of ragis, wherever there were in the world, we have all those recordings. I'm glad. And you have done your work, we have done our work. Yes. But it's fine also to work. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I, I, can I say few, yeah, one please, please. Then I would get back to the comparative uh, thing again. And your many words are oral history and memory. Memory especially, yeah? And this is a problem in all musical traditions. I mean, it's not only India where you have these oral traditions. Even the Western tradition with all the notations and interpretations. I mean, I have, when I started uh, classical piano from a famous Russian pianist, and her parents were teachers, and they, 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 she also could speak because they do that in Russia with a line, uh, lineage to Moscow. And uh, for generation and generation, with every generation, the interpretation changed. And that's the historical yes. thing which Pashara is uh, referring to that history is not, you use the term historical facts, there are no historical facts. It's interpretation in every generation again. And the Indian music interpretation uh, was. Uh, for a long time because Indian music was in the 19th century, the British didn't study it. So uh, it was not studied uh, in, uh, very academically and it became very nationalistic, national, nationalistic uh, interpretation. And one of the things also is always this argument that we have in India this thousands of years the music goes back because it was written in the Sanskrit, uh, you refer to it also. Uh, the theories are written in the Sanskrit sources and we have the Srutis, the microtones, and this, this and that. And all these hundred years of interaction with Muslim music from Central Asia is completely not talked about. That's a very strange, which, and all these, so uh, brilliant work, but memory and, and, and uh, continuity in history and oral history around it, these are very concepts which are 
should be problematized and it should be historicized. Because otherwise, like you said, I also want discussion. We, we are having it, and that's very good. But uh, it, the claim that, no, no, this is the way it comes from uh, Google Nana, that it's, that it's, that it's not a historical claim. Um, so this was kind of the topic of my dissertation. And um, one way that I was trying to deal with this issue of claiming tradition or not is to almost, that is something to be asked, right? So one, we can value the authority of memory and of oral tradition or not, and look towards something that is tangible and written down. So those are two different modes of knowledge that we're looking for. But one thing to look at that I noticed within my research was um, to realize what the pedagogy has been and what it has taught. So I think that was Baldeep's, by Baldeep Singh's point when he was speaking is at least what is the pedagogy that we teach? Like when we're in academia, we learn a certain way to look at things. So that's what he's trying to also argue for is within the Sikh realm as well, it needs to be looked at the claims that, like you're saying, the claims that are being made, but within all of the regards and use this idea of pedagogy, the way that we look at things to then understand all of the traditions okay. and to compare them and to look at them. So while this claim to authenticity via a lineage and tradition can be problematic, it, the same knowledge teaches us a lot about the whole arena in a lot of different ways. It has a lot of knowledge to share. But I want to say a word as a musician, that, that I will speak, uh, we are in America now, about the main uh, music tradition of the 20th century, jazz music, which is improvised, which I, uh, when I was writing my PhD and all the time, that's why I never worked at university. I was touring as a jazz musician throughout Europe. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And uh, I studied Brazilian music in the oral tradition at the Conservatory in Sao Paulo, also during the time. So I also had these teachers. And uh, I can read notes and all that, but you don't use that. Mm -hmm. But then, if you have jazz music, in the 50s, you had Art Blakey and all kinds of drummers, and these traditions still exist. But the way of playing this music changes. So uh, the teaching also changes. It's, just, it's also, again, a historical uh, problem. And yeah? what's informing that change? What type of knowledge and, and it, it, like, as a jazz musician, what type of training have you had to inform the types of things that you bring in and then acknowledging what has come before as well? And that seems to be what I noticed with it is that there is this pedagogical process and this understanding of um, we can improvise, we can change, but how are we doing it and what are we, how are we doing it? Or maybe we don't have any power uh, about that because the society, the societal changes are more important. And all the orchestras, if you listen to uh, older recordings in Europe, uh, they play faster, they play higher. Uh, in yes, music if also. I, if I may, those are details. Just to mention, because the time is up, in the sense that a couple of aspects. One, when I came in, it's been about 30 years, and 27 elders that I've researched. So I do not represent one perspective. That's a misnomer, number one. I'm the, for example, in Jyoti Kala, maybe just before you mentioned, that's where I began to ask the first questions. My question to Baba Sucha Singh was, how can you have musicians who have no training in the ancient system of the Gurbani Sangeet? They can come together, somebody, four or five of them are Tumri singers, some are Khayal singers, some are Tapa singers, Kafi singers. They come together and create what they call Gurnanak Sangeet Padati. I'm the one who questioned them the very act, very first. So actually my question, these are my questions. Memory, I'm questioning where are the memories, I'm looking at it, I'm not proposing any memory to be now implemented everywhere. It's a total misread of my situation, my position. I'm saying let's probe what are the memories that there are available, let's analyze them then. We cannot be jumping to conclusions. These are my questions. The gentleman who performed, he lived, he had shut his doors. It's my work of five and a half years, spread out without my permission, it's my <laughs> liver. That's besides the point. Facts which I'm aiming at are, I'm questioning the facts which are being sold as facts. That's where my position is. I'm saying, if you say you revive this or that, what is the source? And given my family genealogy, it's all the old families we have high case of Guru Das. I don't have to answer it. Go and ask Paisa Bhagniya, other old families, and tell who the lineages are, they're all existing. But the fact that there should not be, we should not be jumping to conclusions even about the attendance with which we are coming in. Right now it's time to probe. 
look for facts and then analyze them. And there's a, the problem with the Gurbani Sangeet field is one major aspect has been shut and something new has been sold and then there is a whole insulation and a threat. That's where I just want to... I have no problem with your... No, no, of course. Anything, you know, <laughs> continue to do that, you know. And all the blessings to you. Gurmeet, my love to you too. So, yes. <laughs>